It's my pleasure to present a cholangiocarcinoma research update for the 2020 cholangiocarcinoma annual meeting. This presentation is really meant to be for uh, a lay audience and for patients and their families and loved ones who would wish to learn more about the development in the last year in the field of cholangiocarcinoma research. Uh, my presentation is not meant to be comprehensive, uh, and I'm happy to say that this would not be possible because research in this area is really growing and um, and uh, the uh, community of researchers has, has really expanded in the last few years. Um, in the current, in, in this slide, I've highlighted the genetics of different subtypes of cholangiocarcinoma. And really, this is re revealing an important advance in the understanding of biliary tract cancer that's emerged over the last few years. And that is that it's not a single disease, but a group of related diseases. Uh, and um, again, one of the um, primary determinants in the, the differences in the disease in terms of response to therapies, uh, the way that the tumors uh, grow in the body and use nutrients and evade the immune system is the genetic features. Uh, in addition, uh, the presence of specific mutations such as IDH, FGFR2, and BRAF have led to successful clinical trials or promising clinical trials with therapies that target those mutations. Uh, and so one of the major uh, objectives in the field has been to better understand how those therapies work and how to uh, optimize their, their efficacy. Um, so first I'll turn to research with respect to IDH mutations in cholangiocarcinoma. These are primarily associated with the intrahepatic form of cholangiocarcinoma. Uh, in brief, mutant IDH has a novel type of cancer mechanism that generates an abnormal metabolite in the cell called D2HG or hydroxy, uh, d uh, 2 hydroxyglutarate that accumulates to very high levels in cells that have this mutation. Uh, this is some work from my lab actually, developing a novel genetically engineered mouse model to try to understand these mutations. And then ultimately to try to simulate uh, therapies in the lab and understand how, how to deploy them better. And uh, just as a brief note, the, the, these mutations in, in IDH or isocitrate dehydrogenase happen in a number of types of cancer, but the specific variant mutations differ between cancer types. The most common mutation in, that is in glioma, a type of brain tumor, is this so-called R132H mutation. In cholangiocarcinoma, there's a slightly different variant on this. And we've developed genetically engineered mouse models to study both of them. And uh, the, the data shows that they have very different capacity to generate this metabolite to hydroxyglutarate. Much higher level is generated with the form that's present in cholangiocarcinoma. And in our mouse model, only the mutation that's in humans associated with the disease, R132C, is effective at generating mouse models of cholangiocarcinoma that effectively recapitulate the human disease. And this is really telling us that you, you need to study cancers within a, within a defined context to really um, uh, understand them. So studying IDH mutations in the, form of, in the context of cholangiocarcinoma is important to be able to make inferences uh, for, for the equivalent human disease. And we've used this model to try to simulate the human clinical trials. Again, in the human clinical trial, IDH mutations have shown some benefit, uh, but not all patients respond and, uh, and progression and, and resistance eventually occur for most patients. Uh, and so we used our mouse model and, and the key um, study here that we showed is that we were able to see slowing of tumors in this mouse model as is seen in many patients but when we did studies um, that effectively um, used mice that had a defective immune system, we found that in fact, the therapy was not effective at all. Uh, and this gave us a hypothesis that a, a major determinant for whether IDH inhibitor, or a, ma a major aspect of the efficacy of IDH inhibition involves some interplay with the immune system. Um, and I'm just going to show a little bit of data on this, but indeed we see that comparing the untreated mice where there's very few uh, immune cells within the tumor, and that's uh, indicated by this lack of 
brown uh, staining in this image from a, from a tumor. Whereas treatment with a mutant IDH inhibitor, uh, which again slows tumor, tumor formation, was associated with uh, a prominent recruitment of immune cells to the tumor. So we and others are using these kind of ideas to try to develop combination approaches that might lead to much more durable effects uh, in model systems, but that hopefully can be translated uh, to the human disease. Uh, now, this isn't the only hypothesis for treating IDH mutant tumors. Uh, and I mentioned earlier the metabolite 2-hydroxyglutarate accumulates to very high levels in IDH mutant cells. And several groups uh, are interested in, rather than turning off mutant IDH, rather harnessing abnormalities that happen in the tumor cell when mutant IDH is there. So not using a mutant IDH inhibitor, but rather understanding the biology of how tumor cells change. And so exciting work from Yale and Sloan Kettering has defined a mechanism by which mutant IDH alters the way that cells are able to repair the DNA. Um, and in fact, creates a state that's somewhat like mutations in the, in the BRCA gene that you might have heard of. The BRCA gene is re responsible for repairing DNA and uh, patients with mutations in this have a high incidence of certain cancer types. So what, what these groups found was that mutant IDH creates a state that's somewhat resembling the DNA repair defects associated with BRCA mutations. And one prediction of that is that uh, there might be a sensitivity to drugs that damage DNA uh, or other therapeutic approaches like radiation therapy uh, and drugs such as PARP inhibitors. So this is just some data from these two groups showing that tumors in, in model systems that have IDH mutations accumulate much more DNA damage. And that can be seen in the middle panel here with the accumulation of this uh, green uh, staining, indicating an accumulation of DNA damage. And both groups showed that in mouse models, treatment with uh, different DNA damaging agents leads to uh, quite effective responses in these, in these models. And this is also being taken in, in the clinic. And so we'll see whether uh, you know, the benefit of this approach versus IDH inhibition uh, itself, um, and uh, again, very exciting new developments based on understanding the biology of these tumors. Uh, now I'm going to turn to another uh, uh, so-called actionable mutation, that is, uh, or alt genetic alteration, that is fusions and other types of mutations in the fibroblast growth factor receptor. So in brief, the normal function of the fibroblast growth factor receptor shown on the right is to transiently respond to growth signals that in a very controlled manner, uh, allow cells to respond to the growth factor in blue in, the, in this panel, which allows the receptor at, at the cell surface to respond to very controlled growth signals. And about 15% of patients with cholangiocarcinoma have an abnormality in their chromosomes in which the normal fibroblast growth factor receptor is fused to another, uh, another gene. And that leads to completely um, independent growth signals that do not require these growth the, the external growth factors. Uh, this on the right is shown data from uh, a clinical trial, the first clinical trial with an FGFR inhibitor. And the panel is showing that tumors frequently shrink when treated with fibroblast growth factor receptor inhibitors. Uh, but unfortunately, not all patients benefit. And again, acquired resistance is, uh, um, frequently occurs. And so our group and others have been trying to understand what underlies the resistance to FGFR inhibitors, as well as to develop or predict approaches that would lead to uh, overcoming resistance. Uh, on the top panel, what we, what we have here is uh, analysis of the cell-free DNA. So DNA that's in the blood that's shed from tumors. And in the blue left-hand panel, uh, where it's listed as BGJ, a patient was treated uh, and blood was drawn at successive time points. And when you can see this green bar going up, that was at the time that treatment started to fail. And that was associated with the accumulation of, uh, of a mutant, uh, the detection of a mutant gene within the cell-free DNA. So the, the tumors had acquired a mutation in, in the FGF receptor that was associated with progression upon BGJ treatment. And in the laboratory, we studied this and we found that several mutations that were seen in the blood of patients who progressed under different FGFR inhibitors 
led to resistance to that FGFR inhibitor in the lab. And that's seen as these long uh, bars on the right, indicating the drug was no longer effective. Fortunately, there's so-called next generation FGFR, FGF receptor inhibitors that have been developed, including one called TAS120. And in the laboratory, many of these mutations that are seen upon resistance can be overcome, but not all of them. In patients, you can see that patients who progressed on BGJ398 and then were, were treated with this next generation inhibitor, the ability to, de to, to uh, detect that mutation in the blood uh, was lost, so that the mutation went away. And these patients responded to that inhibitor for quite some time. So our, the laboratory research is telling us uh, that these mutations can be overcome by these next generation inhibitors. And gratifyingly, there is at least some can be overcome by TAS120. Uh, but still, there's the problem of some mutations that are still, that are still resistant. And uh, we hope that in the future, inhibitors that are able to overcome all the mutations might be developed, or else therapeutic combinations that more durably uh, uh, treat the tumor. Uh, in addition, what we're learning about by the increased amount of genomic analysis of patients' tumors is that there are new drug targets, including new types of alterations in FGF receptor. So work from the data farber that, that my lab is collaborating with has shown a new type of mutation in which instead of a fusion of the FGF receptor, there are alterations in the area that normally binds to this ligand, so normally binds to the growth factor. And again, only have discovered in the last year and a half, uh, but that lead to, in laboratory experiments, abnormal growth, as shown on the, on the right-hand side. Uh, but very gratifyingly, patients who have had those um, in, so-called indel mutations have benefited significantly from treatment with FGF receptor inhibitors. Um, so I've been talking about so-called actionable targets in biliary tract cancer. So that is uh, mutations that predict response to a certain therapy. And you can see here that among intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas, that this comprises about half of, half of uh, patients have so-called actionable targets. But then again, the, there's another half of patients who don't have these mutations. In extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, the frequency is even higher. And so a lot of research in the field has been trying to discover how to treat these other uh, 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 tumors that, that lack these actionable mutations. And one approach that's being taken is to develop more advanced mouse models uh, to study this. I've just shown one example from a group in, in Holland, led by the, Hans Klavers, is the, uh, the leader of these studies, and used normal liver cells and introduced a mutation that's quite common in cholangiocarcinoma, BAP1, which we don't have a good understanding of what BAP1 does to lead to cholangiocarcinoma. What they did was they used a method called CRISPR to uh, introduce these mutations into human liver cells, completely normal liver cells, and then either in, the, in, in tissue culture or by introducing into mice, they examined how these mutations in BAP1 affected growth. And just on the right, what they found was that compared to normal liver cells that have this very nice arrangement, uh, as can be seen with this, with this green staining, they fit together very nicely. Rather, when BAP1 mutant cells uh, uh, were studied, they were in a very disorganized manner. And so hopefully understanding some of this disorganization of tissue that comes from BAP1, uh, there will be predictions for uh, new therapies uh, that, uh, for which there are, are, are none now for patients with that, with that mutation. Uh, in addition, uh, again, I, I've put this pie chart of uh, the actionable and non-actionable mutations. And a, a considerable portion of extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma patients have mutations in KRAS. And until recently, this was considered to be an elusive target. There were no drugs targeting KRAS. But now, I'm very exciting in the field, there are many drugs that are entering clinical, clinical trials that target or inactivate aspects of what KRAS does, either directly or, um, or some of the what we call downstream pathways. And it's going to be very exciting to see how uh, this might have benefit in the clinic. And again, this is a very new development for uh, the so-called uh, you know, uh, elusive target of, of KRAS, which is very common in multiple cancer types and including in both intra and extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. Um, 
Another very important uh, development, uh, and this is work here led by the labs of Wong and, um, and Gretton in, in the NCI, is to study the whole tumor using sophisticated approaches where the tumors are biopsied, but then analyzed for the properties of the tumor cells, but also of the immune cells and also connective tissue cells and blood vessels. And to really understand the interplay with all of these cell types in, in, in the tumor that could influence therapies and, uh, and, and lead to predictions for improved ap uh, approaches, uh, as well as a better understanding of the differences between cholangiocarcinoma between individuals. And that's just one of multiple studies that is trying to understand the cancer as, a, as an entire ecosystem. Uh, so, you know, this is a very uh, brief uh, overview, and I've acknowledged some of the groups that have funded our, our research. Uh, and I'd like to leave with the message that, that funding uh, in the area is growing, uh, and the uh, research interest in the uh, cancer research community has expanded greatly over the last few years. So I'd like to leave with a, a message of, of optimism and excitement that we have, we're understanding the fundamentals of cholangiocarcinoma, and that I believe that with the increased research community and the, the contribution of patients and their families, the donation of tissues, and uh, the work from foundations and federal funding bodies, that we're going to make major progress together in the next few years. So thank you for this opportunity to present to you.